How's it going, everybody? Welcome to this week's incredible Blizzard Warning, the pre-playoff show. Here's our friend, my co-host, Jenna Chavez. Hello. I'm and I'm Kaiser so Riddell. We're going to tackle a bunch of interesting, fun topics tonight about our upcoming playoff run, as so well as some incredible non-NHL news that we have. Big this congratulations awesome. to our DU Pioneers for securing their 10th, I count that, 10 national championships. We defeated Boston College two to nothing to and secure our 10th and most all time for Division I hockey. How yes. about them Pioneers? That was an amazing game. Did you watch the game? Oh, I did. I watched every second of it. I was stuck at work, I but missed, I watched every second. I missed a little bit. I listened to it on the radio from my drive home from work to home, and then I put it back on as soon as I got home and got to finish watching the last, like, 10 minutes. Great game. It was a hard – they battled every game they had. They had, oh, what, yeah. two games that went into overtime? Yeah. So, like – both games up up to us going to the national championship. We played Boston University in the semifinals. Yeah. And that and game got, was ridiculous. We ended up yeah. going to overtime and got a squeaker past the goalie in the five hole. Upset. Mm -hmm. They were Boston University was the number one seed going into the tournament. Yeah. And they decided to, in a way, just let us take control late in the game, which is what DU had been doing really well. Okay. Even yeah. throughout the NCHC tournament, into the Sweet 16, into the five, Frozen Four. Like, mm -hmm. it was absolutely incredible the way they played. And then up against Boston College, I was like, oh, great. They're, you know, they're the number two seed. We're going in as the number three seed. Yeah. And it was like, okay, what the heck are we going to do here? But we outplayed them completely. Oh. Like, and our we outshot them in the first period, eight to five. In yeah. the second period, we outshot them thirteen to seven. And the third, in the third period, was wild because we only had five shots to their yeah, twenty-three. We, yeah, we. So we Boston College that. outshot us total thirty-five to twenty-six shots on goal in that game. Yeah, they got like Boston College got hungry in the third period. Oh yeah, and it was obvious. I mean, considering like we were up two nothing going into the third, and it was oh, huge. Holy. Like, that was, like, career, like, he'll never have a game like that ever again in his life, I don't think. Like, Oh, absolutely one not. Even one of the announcers said that it was the best performance for a goalie at any level he's ever seen. Oh, 100%. Like, Matt Davis stood on his head. Oh, my like, God. Like, and the one thing I kept telling my buddy, like, while we were watching the game, I was like, this is going to be crucial for us to get the first goal and then yeah. like we have to really watch out for these cross eyes passes in the slot yeah. because that is what's been getting getting That's boston college all their goals yeah. and there was one they had a nice beautiful cross eyes feed and davis dove and made the oh, save gosh. with his right. arm side like superman style like, I legit thought that puck went into the it. net. I was like, great, now it's a tie I, game. And all of a sudden, like, everyone went nuts, and like, he had the puck. And I'm like, puck. And I'm what like, the hell just happened? I know. It was amazing. It was amazing. And a fun fact, every year that DU has won the Frozen Faceoff tournament going into the Frozen Four, they've won. Yeah, every year that they've won the NCHC championship, they have won the national championship. Yep. They did in 2017. They did it in 2022. And then now they did it in 2024. Uh -huh. And what's crazy to think about is, I believe this is Carl's second national championship as head coach. And our last one before that was Jim Montgomery as our head coach in 2017. Correct. Correct. And then a year later, Montgomery left and went up to the NHL level and coached the Stars. Well, and DU's coach, he coached a bunch of the Boston players at the... He was an World assistant in Boston, in Boston, at Boston University for a few years. 
Yeah, and he coached the U.S. World Juniors or whatever, and they had, like, seven or eight of their kids on the team. Yeah, it was... So he was familiar with their play. Like, he knew what we were going up against, and he was prepared. Yeah, he, like, he's one of... I could put him up there as one of the best coaches we've ever had. He's calm, collective. Like, his coaching well, style reminds me of how Bedner coaches. Like, this calm, collective, like, doesn't show a whole lot of emotion, but... He he gets fired up too. He does. He has no problem firing those boys up. And I think we could win a couple more national championships in the in the coming years. Yeah, because I mean our guys are young. They were the second youngest team, com- only second only to Boston. Yeah, I mean we had we had Massimo Rizzo, who's huge influence on the team. It was his national his second national championship with us. Yeah. Our season. captain, it was his second national championship. Mm-hmm. So, like, there was, like, five guys on this on this roster that were with the team in 2022 for their ninth title. Correct. So, it's, it's incredible to see that. But a lot of those guys are now leaving is, you know, being seniors. So, it's kind of yeah. going to be nice and curious to see how they come back and play to defend the title next season. Correct. But, I'm excited. And as I wanted to say, a big congrats and a huge shout out to our Denver Pioneers yep. for securing their 10th and now holding the most Division I hockey national championships in history. We stand alone on the mountaintop. We stand alone on the mountaintop. <laughs> I like it. It was a great game. And I loved the interview at the end because there's uh, – set of brothers on the, the brothers <laughs> and the, i think it was the younger brother he totally dropped an f-bomb on live tv and then he like immediately and apologized he goes, like oh i'm sorry and, he goes, oh! <laughs> <laughs> and his brother's just standing behind him just dying and i'm like mom and dad are so proud buddy <laughs> and speaking of one of the brothers one of the two brothers, I don't remember if it was the younger or the older one. I think it was the older one. He just signed his entry-level contract with the Philadelphia Flyers. I believe it was the older one. Yeah. So he just signed. So I'm, I'm excited to see him up in the in the NHL ranks and yep. see how he does. I mean, what is that? We have, what, 90 or more that have oh, gone we have to be? so many. I think it's 90 current. The, the um, former U players in the NHL, yeah. Uh-huh. I mean, Logan O'Connor's one of them. Yeah, I know. Oh, o- season, o- o- his alum is DU, so. Yeah, I know. I'm a lock. You know, you know how I feel about locks. I'm a <laughs> lock. They go with LOC. All right, well, moving forward from that now, after okay. our huge congrats, we're going to go into our last four games and the recaps of those. Very, very disappointing recap and a lot to say about them. We're going to start off with the one game we really needed to win so bad. I was at that game and I was so excited to go to that game. And I was like, yes, this is going to be such a great, like, playoff hockey. Guys, it was flat from the get-go. Like... It was ugly. It was not good. So, like, the first period, we were pretty even in shots with them. They had 13 shots. We had 12. Yeah. But the downside to all that was, I mean, Sean Walker scores early. Uh, Really early. early. Thought it was going to be great. Yeah. And then, of course, our one nemesis that we can't stand here in Denver, Matt Duchesne, decides to tie the game. Yeah. I and then worked. Jamie Ben comes out and scores two minutes later to take a 2-1 lead to end out the first period. Yep. So it's like, okay, cool. Maybe we can battle back. But then come the second period, Lecky comes in and ties it. All right, cool. All the better. Oh, let's just uh, go with three more goals on the Dallas Stars side. Mm. Go and down 5-2. to two. Yeah. Like, un believable I, and then you know Duhame tries to cut the deficit in the last minute of the second period makes it a 5-3 game 
German yeah. comes out halfway through the third, makes it a 5-4 game. We, you know, I think we're making a comeback here. Right. No, then we give up two more late goals, and we end up falling 7-4. to four. Soft goals, too. And they're not Soft they're goals. Making hard. They're not making hard shots. Like, we're not making it. They're not having to work for it. Well, like, what helps Dallas in that game is they were three for three on the power play. Yes. Like, we were one and two on the power play. We, we were 50% on the power play. But we need to stop taking these dumb penalties that create these opportunities for them, for any team to go up on us like that. Correct. And then, like, another big stat from that, takeaway from that game is, like, we had 18 takeaways and with those 18 takeaways we have to produce when you have that many takeaways you have to put pucks in the net and we were not and we were not capitalizing on those turnovers that we caused and created and like that's just like that's a huge problem especially in a game like the dallas game that was so important for our run to win a fifth straight title or conference title Right, yes. Or division title, my bad. My apologies. <laughs> no, where are you going? But because of that, like, that created a three, four-point gap in between us and Dallas to be able to go after the center division title. So, I mean, that was that's just bad. So then moving on to the next game, we ended up getting a W against Minnesota. Yeah, much needed, but like we needed the two points, but like it wasn't huge in playoff, you know, implication in a sense. But we came out and McKinnon puts up a hat trick, a beautiful hat trick. Beautiful. All three, like two of the three goals were breakaways that he just unleashed gorgeous. his speed from center ice. Just gorgeous. Like I he just he looked like them... he was on a rocket ship. I think one of them he hit like his he hit like twenty two miles an hour going into the zone before he shot and I was just like, there he is. <laughs> like I mean, it was huge to get that five two win, and then like we put on thirty two shots on goal. We held them to to, to held uh, held them to twenty two shots. Yep. You know, we were one for four on the power play. We had twelve takeaways again, and that time, you know. Showing what takeaways can do, we produced and took advantage of it. Yep. So, I mean, that was a huge two points. So, we were kind of all riding on a high note going into our next game, thinking, yeah, cool, we need to beat Winnipeg. This is going to be huge. This is a huge, you know, conference or division implication. Uh And what do we do? We Not delay up. an egg. We gave up a touchdown and an extra point to Winnipeg. I thought I was watching a football game. It was bad. Like absolutely utter embarrassment. It was bad. It was zero like, defense, zero oh offensive gosh. production. Nobody was skating. All of our defensemen were never ahead of the play. They were always chasing the Winnipeg players. Like it was so bad. Well, I mean, think about it. All right, so Georgie gets the start. Yeah. And we're down for nothing 15 minutes into, like, literally 15 minutes into the, ga- into the game, into the yeah. first period. Just, we're down for nothing. And yeah. what do we do? We yank him. We yank Georgie, put Annan in. And, and, I mean, Annan can only do so damn much. Yeah. He, he could only do so much. Yes. So, like, especially and when your defense that, isn't playing in front of you, your offense isn't putting pucks in the net. Like, he's kind of just there. Yeah. So then, like, I was kind of watching the game. Like, I kind of put it on the back burner, in a sense, after the first period. And I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. Not a big deal. I'm kind of just listening to it. And then, like, next thing you know, I look over at it. It's seven to nothing. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Uh-huh. Yeah. The loudest cheer from the crowd was when they pulled Giardia. Oh, that was yeah. I I I I was cheering too. I just said there was about damn time. 
I know. I was like, I was done after like two. I was like, okay, I think, I think we might. That's where I was at. I was like two, like three goals in like that quick succession. I'm like, yank him. He's done. Yeah, done, done. But yeah, he's, I don't understand why we are allowing offenses to be in our zone for so damn long. Well, like the crazy thing about that whole game is we outshot Winnipeg 30 to 26. Yeah. And yet we still lose 7 to 0. And we had one of the best faceoff percentage games in a long time. We had 71.2% on faceoffs. We were incredible in the faceoff dot for like we've never been a strong faceoff team, but no. we were on point with our faceoffs all game, but we just couldn't do any sort of production. It was absolutely yeah. her. Well, horrendous. we didn't get our shots on goal until the end of the game because. Yeah, I mean, we did put up thirteen shots in the third the period. Period. We only had three shots on goal. Yeah, first period was five. Yeah, it was not good. Yeah, no, not good at all. So, but, I mean, like, that was huge implication because that got Winnipeg to jump above us in the standings right behind and Dallas. Game, and, like, that the- game was crucial because we had a scenario to where basically if Dallas lost out and we won the rest of our games, we could still win the Central. Correct. However, once Dallas won a game, they automatically won the Central, which is fine. That's but that was a huge game for us to get for home ice. Correct. So then the Jets basically took our tiebreaker away from us with that seven to no seven nothing win. Uh-huh. And then we go to our next game, which was a huge, another must win game. Yeah. That I thought was in the bag because we started off so strong. Like yeah, McKinney. We started off. Up two nothing by the end of the end of the first period. Oh yeah, Ross Colton got our first goal, and then McCarr. And then like second period, McKinnon 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 Natushkin yeah. feeds Miko. Miko makes it a three nothing game. And then all of a sudden, like we're going into the third period, and I'm thinking, all right, cool, let's just play defensive hockey. Let's you know keep keep our foot on the gas. This yeah. and that. No, they came out flat. Yeah, we got the goalie interference call that went our way, and I was like, all right, like right, let's just keep going. And they did not. They 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 did not at all. Yeah, so we did what? We gave three goals up, let them like, tie it, gave up like, three right, unanswered goals. Like, right away. And then we go into overtime, and it's we over. let them take both points. Both we got points. a point out of it, but... The problem with that is it only tied us with Winnipeg, and then all Winnipeg needed to do was win a game, and they secured their spot ahead of us. And because after, after the Winnipeg game that we played them, it sealed the fate that we would be playing with us losing. We were playing Winnipeg first round of the playoffs. Yeah. That was a sealed fate. But now we were. Playing the nights for home ice. Right. And we decided to lay an egg on that. So yeah. now it's it's not it's looking a little bleak. Going from the super big high that we had three weeks ago, we we're cool, we could win the division, we could do this, you know, finish second in the conference to now we're sitting third in the division. And like what what do we what do we do now? Like, what, what's gone so wrong? And this is where I want to get into that. Because, in my opinion, we have had no motivation for any of our last five games. It just doesn't, it really doesn't feel like there's a drive or any desire to play or win hockey games, to be quite honest. It's just, it feels like they're just going through the damn motions Motion. at this point. It's like, yeah, we'll just show up today and, like, move the It's like they're trying to rest themselves without resting themselves. Because, like, 
this late in the season when every game matters and every point matters. Yeah. This isn't the time to just sit back and like, I get it. Like wanting to rest players and all that and players wanting to rest themselves and like not play as hard, but Mm. do that when your position is already locked in for the playoffs. Yeah. Like we were still very much fighting for seating position. Exactly. Like it, it, it was huge. And they had no business unless there was an injury. There was no reason or necessi- necessity to be rushing. There was, you had everything to be playing for. Well, like a lot of people, like it, um, I'm not included in this, but a lot of people are saying it, it's goaltending's fault. It's goaltending's fault. Oh, it's all goaltending's fault. Freaking out about the goaltending and saying but it has nothing to like. It. A goaltender can only do so damn much. Yeah, that's, I agree with you to an extent, Kaiser. Like, I I do think that there's something going on with Georgia, like, mentally, but I think it's just pure frustration. And I think like, well, he, has to, he has to figure out a way to have points scored on him in, goal, in games and shake it off and get back in the crease and defend. But in order for him to do that, our defense has got to start helping him out. Well, that's what I was going to say. Like, his frustration, like, I, I'm i siding with Georgie on this. Like, his frustration is stemming from no defense help in front of him. Yeah, I feel like. Like, I, like I, feel I was saying, he can only do so much with no defensive help. Yeah. And he has so many times where he's, they're, they're just allowing his net to be assaulted. And at some point when that happens, we know because we're good at doing it when we do it, you get goals. And that's exactly what's been happening. Well, like the problem is, is normally like the defense didn't have to work super hard because our forwards are just peppering the other goalie. We were putting up big points. But when both our forwards and our defense are both just kind of lackluster playing and just sitting back and going through the hullabaloo as he as I yeah. could say is like it's not gonna it's not gonna help and then when he's getting peppered like a damn salt shaker like what but, what do you expect him but, to do like it's not all on Georgie like yeah his frustrations he needs to manage his frustrations a lot better in my opinion I it's so, my it's the same opinion that I have about McKinnon that I do about Georgia rein it in like I understand you're frustrated. I understand things need to go different. But you being like that and acting like that, they're not going to help. It's not going to do a damn thing. No, but, I mean, sometimes, like, on a goalie's perspective, like, they're not skating next to the guys constantly right. on the it's ice. So, like, if he's not team. showing some sort of frustration, you're not getting your message across to the guys. Yeah. Like, hey, I'm pissed off. I need some fucking help here. Right. Like, please help me out. <laughs> Like, like protect the net. And I mean, Anon's been showing the same frustration as well yeah. towards that, and like it's, it really shows that it's a problem with our defense right now, and them slacking off and not, not following their assignments, not covering their man, not playing. Like, there's times defense. Like, what the hell is the whole thing with Josh Manson being like completely behind the guy he's supposed to be defending? Like they're they're playing too um, safe of a defensive style for right now for what so we're what? getting peppered with. Like, yeah, I, was like, yeah, I wasn't expecting us to have this huge run on these last stretch of this of our regular season because we had one of the toughest remaining schedules in the league. Yeah, based on where everyone's sitting at and their point percentage, like we have one of like the third highest hardest end of schedule in the league so it's like you can't really put it all on the goalies i mean some of it goes on to it because some of them are soft but like frustration wise like you're gonna get off your game it it happens like especially when you're getting peppered making these huge saves but your offense ain't helping and putting pucks in the net themselves right so that can cause a lot of frustration and mental you know disdain since the Nashville game. What was that? Georgiev hasn't been the same since the Nashville game. No, he hasn't. Ever and since like, so 
something. His brush, like the first time I saw him show his frustration, I think it was the Nashville game to when he that, shot the puck into the into the, the crowd on act like it was accidental, but was you could literally just see his face just go, God, nothing can go like. He just got this mentality that just nothing can go right for him at this moment. And like, mm -hmm. I think he's trying to shake that. But it's hard to shake it. It's hard to shake it when you're getting peppered, like, you know. Yeah. I mean, you've had eight goals scored on you in 24 hours. Like, it's, Not a good it's, feeling. it's hard to shake that. Like, yeah. I, I'm, I'm confident in him to have it shaken. And him back to quality play by the time we start up on the playoffs. Which but, to be Monday. Yeah. Because I think we play Thursday and then we get three more days or we play tomorrow. Yeah. And then we, we have like Thursday. three or four more days off. And then. And then yeah. They're saying that they're even saying that there's actually space for a game Sunday. Hmm. But. Inside information that I've heard is saying Monday. I would I would probably go with Monday as well. I think Monday would be our official start date. But with the problem with that is like we have to go to Winnipeg. We have to go to Winnipeg. Back to the scene of the crime. Oh no, we Which, were here. Never mind. We were here, but we were here for that one. Playing in Winnipeg, like we've never played Winnipeg we've in never, the final. I hate or that. in the playoffs. I hate playing in Winnipeg. Well, before we get into talking about the Winnipeg thing, yeah. what do you think, like our general discussion topic here, what do you think that we really need to do and like shift around to try to right, fix whatever ship. shortcomings we've had? I don't know if they need to have a team like, meeting come to jesus like what the hell are we doing are, are we ready to go home like are you guys ready to hit the golf course or are you guys so ready to play hockey like see like my big thing is i think landeskog basically needs to have a players only meeting no coaching staff nothing just a players only meeting on. and it basically needs to just kick them in the fucking ass and be like look you guys need to get your heads out of your ass you need to figure your shit out yep get it together Bedner could probably do with maybe doing a couple line swaps and just to maybe shake some things up, maybe get some extra chemistry elsewhere. So in case that happens, yeah, like I wouldn't mind seeing a couple different, you know, I forward love, pairs. I love, I actually really like it when Bednar messes with the lines because I think it throws the teams off because then they don't know what to expect from us. Well, and then it also shakes up the players too, because yeah. then they're like, I have to play extra hard because I don't know how well we're no, going to no, vibe together and this or that. Yeah. Like, you keep the same line combos for so long, players start to get complacent and expecting the same thing like that's been working to just keep working. Mm -hmm. Going into playoff hockey, it's not going to work. Like yeah. you have to shift. You have to shift things up. You got to shake it up. Yeah. No, I think I think that they. I think that you are right. I think that they need to have a players only meeting. And just, they need to have a, a serious gut check right now and just say, like, what the hell are we doing? And where yeah. do we want to go? And what do we want to do? Because at this point, honestly, it's looking like four games and we're going to be home at this yeah, point. Yeah, like, precisely. Like, I mean, I don't want to say that. And I'm like, I'm a diehard Avs fan. I love the Avs, but with the way they've played right now, like, I'm super nervous about this game. And we are not, Winnipeg is at our number for a few years. Yep, yeah, they really have. I mean, like, we played them good early in the season, but late in the season, like, we just haven't been playing, we haven't been playing our hockey. Hockey. Like, we haven't been playing avalanche hockey. And it's mm -hmm. been very, very disappointing to watch. And, like, yeah. another thing that, like, I'm sorry to say it, all you fans watching, but Landeskog is not coming back this year. No. He's not coming back into the playoffs. You need to stop thinking that's going to even be remotely good for us to do. Well, and because, I mean, Ednar said this week that he's not even close. He's, he's nowhere near ready. Coach. He's not even close. 
there's absolutely no way we would throw Landis Cog back in the lineup playing in the playoffs after he hasn't even played a single game in two, in two and a half seasons. years. Two and a half seasons. Like, mm -hmm. why would you think the best thing for us to do is to throw him back into the lineup during playoff hockey after coming off the type of injury that he's going through? Yeah. And the type of surgery that he had, it, the type of surgery he had has a very, very low returnability rate. Oh, it's, yeah. He's fighting. I don't think that a lot of fans understand. No player has come back ever and maintained their career. Ever. ever after having the surgery that Landeskog had, That's it's an right. experimental surgery that he's had, and he's just, you have to take it very slow if we expect him to come back at all. Well, and so I learned today that after after he started on ice skating, what back in January? Yep, he had a setback. I didn't know that. They kept that very quiet. But I guess he would have, like, days where he was skating at 70 75%. And then the next day, he felt like he was at, like, maybe 20%. And they're like, okay, well, that's not good. So he had a – he did have a setback during the recovery after yeah. he got the ice. Which, like, I expected Which, that to happen. I was expecting that. I don't – I think a lot of the abs fans thought that as soon as he touched the ice, like that meant that everything was good to go. And that, no, <laughs> like he's <laughs> having to relearn to skate too, because he's even said that he picked up some very bad habits because he didn't have the ability to go side to side. Yeah. Which that's crucial in any sort of game, especially his game, because yeah, when he's he plays in front of the net, you have to be able to shuffle side to side and back and forth. Like if you're unable yeah. to do that, he can't play the center position like he knows how. Right. So, so I mean the fact that he even played as well as he did for the year that we won the cup is pretty much a miracle. Yeah. Like, honestly, if you look at it, like that's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> So, I think, yeah, they just, they need to have a serious gut check and ask themselves, like, what the hell do we want and what are we going to do to get it? Yeah, so in short, basically what we need from the abs is our defense to step it up, our point producers to actually start scoring Maybe. some goals and making just things happen, them. and basically our goalies need to figure it the fuck out in between the pipes and figure their angles out and just find their true game. And quit, like, I understand the goals getting in when the puck's been in your zone for fucking ever. But enough with the soft pucks, guys. Like, you make these amazing saves set time after time, and then it's just like, oh, sorry. Missed that one. <laughs> like, come on. You're better than this. So, after all that, like, looking at the standings now, it's, it's sad to say Dallas – is sitting with one game left to play at 111 points. Winnipeg sitting with one game to play with 108. Yeah. We have one game left to play, which is tomorrow evening. We have 105 points. Mm -hmm. Sadly, for the first time in four years, yeah, our streak of being Central Division champs is over. Has gone. Yeah. We wanted the last four straight seasons, which has been great. But, I mean, I would have loved to have the fifth straight title. It was four or five. I can't remember how many in a row it was at that point. Yeah. But our streak is over of winning the Central Division. Dad, I hate to say this, but congrats to the Dallas Stars for winning the Central Division, which, in my opinion, is the toughest division in hockey. I agree. Hands down the toughest, tightest fighting division in all of hockey. So that's that's our sad note for that because we had every, every bit of chance to seal that and actually pull it in. But then we decided to come out and start playing like we have been and laying an egg in every yeah. game we down had, the stretch. We had complete control of our fate and then we just... We just didn't give a flying. <laughs> yeah. 
No, it was it was unbelievably just. It's been pretty disgusting to watch. If you it's ask me, like honestly, it's just like hard to watch, and it's just like. I'm a diehard Avs fan, but I will talk. I will tell you that they're playing like shit when they're playing like shit. Yeah. Like I will tell you how it is, and like I don't sugarcoat it. I'm not going to just sit there and praise everything that they're doing good when they're doing all sorts of wrong. Wrong, like bad like, things. Like, they're like I, I'm, I'm not just your typical like crazed fan that's gonna always say that they're always playing great. No, we look yeah. like absolute trash right now, and we yeah. really need to fix it because of the fact that we are going into the playoffs against Winnipeg. Yeah, Winnipeg in Winnipeg on the road for the first time since 2019. So, yeah, we're playing on the road for the first time to start the playoffs since 2019. Uh -huh. We're also playing the Winnipeg Jets for the very first time in a playoff series. Which is crazy, but okay. And on top of that, it's just not going to be an easy thing. And this is what we're going to have to expect from this. From this upcoming playoff. They're fast. They're not as fast as we are. No. But they're, they're fast. They move the puck really well. Oh. We have a really hard time playing on the road as of this season. Mm-hmm. And then, um, like, I don't know. We're close to 500 with road games this season. Yeah. Uh oh, how's it going, David? Is this team playoff ready? I think so. Like, as long as they knock these cobwebs off that we have going on right now. Yeah. Like, they just, like, I think they're trying to just, like, save their bodies in a sense to for come playoff time. The team's ready. Like, we have the most goals scored in the entire league. Yeah. And I think we're fifth and lowest goals against. So, as long as Georgie can figure his stuff out, and Annan's ready to be, be to go in as backup if need be, I I do think this team can go really deep. Are they ready to actually make another cup run? I'm on the fence about that one. To be completely honest, yeah, like, we're having just like basically like what we have to go into Winnipeg and we have to win one of the first two games. We have to win one game on oh, the road. We have to we have to win a game in Winnipeg. Because if we if we go down 2-0 in the series and then come back here, we are pretty much screwed. Yeah. Yeah, no, I if we if we lose both games on the road, I do not see us getting out of the first round. Uh, here's a question that was just asked. Should Annan start game one? No. I actually kind of think he should. Kaiser. He's only played like 20 games and then he's That's out. okay. He's been stopping more pucks than Georgie. Fair. Georgie gave up four in the first period, gave up three unanswered, four unanswered goals four. against Vegas. Yeah. So, I mean, he's given up eight goals in the span of four periods. So, I I kind of agree with that. Like, I think Annan should start. I mean, game one, like, in Which a way, that's what that's the one game that's that's the tone. Like, it's a hot take, but I I, I think he should. He's That's proved himself to be worth he proved he's proved himself to be good in between the pipes yeah. when he's needed to be. Yeah. And I mean, game one, like maybe it'll give Georgie that day off to be able to kind of get his mind right before coming back into the game. Or does it suck with Georgie more mentally than he's already? I think trying to throw him in on another game and him getting lit up again is gonna be more harm than sitting him for another game. Yeah. I don't know. Because all right, so game one of any playoff series, that is your tone setting game. Yeah. And Annan's been playing really stellar in between the pipes. Yeah. So 
I mean, put him, start him in game one. We get the win. We have the tone set for the for the series. Georgie comes in game two, unless Annan posts a shutout in game one. Then Annan continues to start until you know, until something happens. But I mean, I actually one hundred percent think Annan should get the start in game one. Hot head, Kaiser. Well, Georgie's been showing he's a holy mess. He's Swiss cheese right now. I mean, you're yeah. I mean, you're trying to. <laughs> You're making a strong argument. Yeah, like like David just said, go with your hot goalie. And right now, Anna Georgie is not goalie. hot. He is colder than a baguette. Oh, he's it's bad. It's bad. Like he's Swiss cheese right now, man. And it's just not. It just won't work. Like no. you can't go into the playoffs and like he's got one of the lowest goals against average in the league. That's he's true. got like a 2.88 goals against average, and that's so high compared to anyone else. Yeah. Like, we can't afford to go in and just him just show his frustrations again and just let in easy pucks and us be down 3 nothing, 4 nothing after two periods in the first game of the playoffs. I don't feel like pulling him and putting Annan in would be a wise decision. I feel like it has to be, like, Annan from the start or Georgia from the start of game one? So I, That's why I think, like, if we give Georgie the start tomorrow night and he plays well, cool. Maybe we can go with Georgie. Yeah. But if he ends up having a rough game, no, you go with you go with Annan. Yeah. Because that's just going to kill his confidence more if he gives up a bunch of goals next game, his next start. Like, it's just not going to work. <laughs> so, so I mean like so I I kind of expect if we come out and we win one of the two games in in Winnipeg, I think we win that series in six. Yes, I agree with you. If we do not win any games in Winnipeg. Then I think we lose in six. I or even lose in five. Yeah. But then again, coming back home, we've been the hottest team on home ice all season. And I think that's going to continue. I hope so. Because we play really good in front of our own fans. So, like, we could easily tie that series up. Lose two, win the next two. But the problem with that is in the playoffs, it's all about momentum. And if you're coming, yeah. leaving your like leaving game one and two up to nothing and you go, you know, go to the, you know, your opponent's rink, you're going to have all that momentum to just want to shut the door on them. And next thing you know, we could be down three Oh in the series. Correct. So I really think if we split the series, split the two games in Winnipeg, we could win both here. We could win in either five or six. Yeah. I but I think we'll end up winning both here. We'll split. We'll split in Win- Winnipeg. We'll win both here, and then we'll lose in Winnipeg, and then we'll close it out here in Game Six. Is my oh. my my thought process? I'd like to win it in five, and get a little couple games rest before the set next series starts. But uh-huh. that's not always a good thing. Sometimes I like going later games in the series. Because yeah. then you just keep your momentum and your hot streak going, and you, rest can kill the momentum. Right. Exactly. So moving beyond that, let's get to our next topic. Kale McCarr was named the finalist, a finalist for this year's King Clancy Memorial Trophy. That tro- that award goes to the player that exemplifies the best leadership. On and off of the ice. Wow. I did not see who the other two nominees are or the I other two know. finalists. However, I think McCarr has a strong case for this. I mean, I he's think. also going to be named finalist for, he's going to also be named finalist for the Norris, but I think that might end up going to Quinn Hughes because yeah. Hughes has had an incredible season with Vancouver because Vancouver's had an incredible season. Incredible season. 
like I didn't see them coming at all. At all. <laughs> so the dark horse. <laughs> But like I, I think he could actually end up winning that, depending on who else has been nominated um, as finalists, because they always nom they always give you three finalists, and with him being one of the three, um, well, is it one per team? One per team. That's what that's what Graham's saying. I thought that was for the Selkie, for the most the, for the. Basically, for a player with the least amount of penalty minutes. <laughs> but okay, well, I I think he could get it, but I, I I don't know. It's pretty pretty. I mean, you got thirty one other people you're going against, so um, I don't know. He could get it, but I think his his chances of the Norris are a little higher. Just based on, you know, best defenseman for your team. Let's see, looking at he's not too far behind Quinn Hughes in points. He's only he's got McCarr's got 89 points and Quinn Hughes only has 91. So oh. so I mean that's only a two point difference in the race for you know the Norris. And oh. if we have a good game tomorrow night and McCarr puts up three points, that could put him on top for the defenseman for points. Right, and I don't know how the Clancy the Clancy Memorial Trophy voting is and how that goes, but I think with if you know with like how like humble and like down to earth he is and how much he does in the community, like he's a really really high the high finalist in my opinion. Oh, absolutely, he should be. I don't I don't see why he wouldn't. All right, so let's move on to our big name. Nathan McKinnon's heart hopes are still alive. Yeah, absolutely. Well, here's where the hopes kind of hurt him a little bit. He didn't get any points in against. He, he was shut out point wise Winnipeg. against Winnipeg. Yeah. So that kind of hurt him a little bit. Yeah. He's sitting. Four points behind Kucherov right now. Fuck Kucherov. Kucherov is sitting with 142 points. Our boy Mac sitting with 138. I know. So he may not win the point race, but I believe he is still the hands-on league-wide favorite to win the heart because, I mean... The heart is for the most valuable player to your team. Okay, so the next closest person to Kucherov is like 10, 12 points behind him. Yeah. Like well, Kucherov is a stat pattern. 90 percent of Kucherov's goals have come on a power play or an empty net. Um, and he's gotten a bunch of assists, but they're all on the power play and like assists on empty nets I against a bunch of garbage teams in their division. I then you look at McKinnon, and he has Miko, who also has 100-plus points in the season. Yeah. First time that the Avs have had that since 95-96 when Zach and, Zach and Forsberg had both had 100-point seasons yeah. in the same year. So, in my opinion, I think that shows McKinnon as the most valuable player towards his team because – he pushes them to be better, and because of that, we have 200-point scores on our roster in the same year. Right. As well as we're battling for a top spot, you know, for the playoffs. We're going to be fighting in the playoffs. Uh -huh. So I really do think his, his, fav his odds are still skyrocketed high. I don't see why they shouldn't be. Yeah, I can see how they dipped a little bit with the shutout against Winnipeg, but I well, don't... Well, not only that, it's also Kucherov just hit 100 assists. Yeah. Like, he also has an 100 assist season. So, like, that's... That's kind of hard to take. Like, he's got... Kucherov has 43 goals and 100... Like, 
I think 101 assists. And then McKinnon's got 51 goals and 87 assists. But the big difference is Kucherov's only a plus 10. Yeah. McKinnon is a plus 34. As I was gonna say, he's a plus a lot. He's a plus 34 player yeah. this season. So that in itself. I was thinking plus 16, but I think that's Makar that I'm thinking of. So I mean like it's it's definitely possible that like yeah, a lot of people think Kucherov, but I swear I'm going to lose my mind if the NHL snubs McKinnon again. Because he's been snubbed twice already, McDavid, when he should have 100% got it, but they gave it to McDavid just because McDavid's McDavid. Go figure. Right. McDavid's basically the Tom Brady of the NHL. I know. Like, just the face, and everyone wants to go to him. I was just educating someone on how we do not like Connor McDavid. Yeah, no, we do not support Connor McDavid. No, we do not. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> we do not like him at all. <laughs> he was like, but why? And I was like, because, no. <laughs> <laughs> so our next game, our final game of the regular season, we close it out against... Edmonton, Edmonton and Connor McDavid at home. And Dry Sidle. It the game will be on ESPN at 7 30 tomorrow night. Oh well, I can watch it. It is our final home game, our final regular season home game. We will close out, hopefully with the W. And this is gonna be a big test to see which goalie is gonna be the one that starts come the playoffs, in my opinion. Yeah. So, aside from that, I hope McKinnon can put up three, four more points tomorrow night just because I'd like to see a high-scoring game on our end, see that our offense is firing on all cylinders. Like, we can only hope, and we need them to get their heads out of their asses, in my opinion. So badly. So badly. Like, yesterday badly. So... To conclude the show this evening, we're going to talk about a non-avalanche topic, which has been huge lately. The Arizona Coyotes are moving to Utah. It is going to be a complete rename, recolor. The Coyotes owner, as of now, is maintaining the Coyotes rights and the logo rights. And they have Five years per Batman, he has five years to secure a land deal with an arena and all that. And if he does that within five years, they will grant the Coyotes an expansion draft and let them be back into the league. Right. However, if he does not, then so long. Yeah, goodbye. I don't think it'll happen because they're already having such a hard time even trying to do that. Arizona doesn't want anything to do with hockey right now. Do with a stadium. They don't want anything to do with a stadium. And then on top of that, because of them moving to Utah, there's been a lot of scheduling conflict going on, as well as a possible realignment of the divisions. Yeah. This Which could, could include our abs. avalanche. Yeah, this could impact the abs. One rumor is they want to move two Canadian teams to the Pacific. Yeah. And someone from the Pacific to the Central to match out with the Utah coming over here. Yeah. They're also wanting to talk about even the abs getting moved to the Pacific. And moving yeah. someone from the Pacific over to the Central. like. There are all these different implications that could happen, and because of that, would kind of screw us up. Say if they moved us, the Avalanche, to the Pacific Division, 90% of our games will be played at 8, 8.30 at night. Yeah. It's gonna suck. And for me, I think that's way too damn late for us in okay. here. For I the can't. fact that we are so used to these 7, 7.30 games, you move it an hour back, and it's going to screw with our viewership. Yeah. It'll be too late for teams to want to, for, you know, 
us to want to go to the games if we're having eight o'clock start time games then yeah i really really hope that they do not do this i mean like the home games would still be seven o'clock games but when we're playing on the road they're gonna all be eight eight thirty games we're doing division games yeah there's no way around it because it's all gonna be on the west coast and then also there's talks because of Utah moving, there's talks of bringing in two more teams as of right now as an expansion within the next three years. Yeah. Atlanta, They're talking of bringing Atlanta and then a team in Houston. Houston, that's the other one, Texas, yeah. So with that, um, I would suggest, in my opinion, if we do do that, we bring two more teams in, you do a complete realignment of all the divisions to where each conference will have four divisions of four teams per division. Per division, yeah. And then doing that, each winner, like the winner of each division, get the top four playoff spots. And then you right. see them based on where their what their records were. And then the last four are basically your wild card spots. Best records get in, bottom four, there's your eight. And then when you go back, go into the playoffs, you just have the number one seed play the eight seed, two seed play the seven seed. Seven go seven. back to the traditional seeding because, in my opinion, this playoff crap to where the first round is, if you're not a division winner, you're playing the other team in your division that made the playoffs is crap. Yeah. It needs to go back to this 1v8, 2v7. One. Yeah, and so on and so forth, because then well, you really get a true quality playoff. Like you actually get rewarded for being top seed, right? That's Instead of NBA getting screwed with having yeah. to play with your the other division, your third division opponent, right? In the first round, it's yeah. I, I hate that. Yeah, I agree. It's like I we agree. played that we played this division opponent enough during the regular season. Why are we forced to play them in the first round? Right. So, but with that, like yeah. that could no, have some huge implications on us if they do decide to move us. And I don't yeah. know how that's going to work. Batman's got two separate schedules or a schedule revised right now for them moving to Utah. And the official move date is rumored to be tomorrow yeah. after their it's final day. Yeah. So, like it's, the sale is final, like, it's yeah. already happening done now i just i'm curious what the name's gonna be like new name new colors yep. new logo it's, it's fresh the start of the utah jazz so we'll see they already have the arena they're ready to go oh yeah they're hockey ready yeah well um, i think uh that should conclude us tonight huh think so i'm interested to see how this Game one in and in scenario could play out. I'm kind of on board now, Kaiser. <laughs> See, I'm very convincing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll see how they play tomorrow night against Edmonton. Well, everyone, let's uh, wish our boys uh, good luck tomorrow night against Edmonton. And Probably we will be back Wednesday. next Wednesday to hopefully cover the first couple games of our playoff. Yeah, at least one. Well, that'll do it and conclude us for Blizzard Warning. I'm Kaiser Riddell. I'm Jenna Chavez. And see you later. Go Abs, go. Go Abs. Bye.